Hello, and welcome to the Wheel of Crime podcast. This podcast is ran by two ladies who play games, mumble profanities, and laugh way too often. Also, this podcast does cover topics of sensitive nature, and as such, listener discretion is advised. back to the wheel of crime podcast my name is jen and my name is emily yas welcome back uh it's been an- <laughs> yas. An- <laughs> yas. it's been another full seven days since our last episode Woo-hoo. wow here we are again another friday yes how has your week gone jen you've been busy busy with work would be my guess because that's like a normal thing uh any anything interesting happened though yeah always busy with work consistently it seems but yeah like i was me and emily were kind of chatting up before the show because you know we are friends in real life um <laughs> despite what you might get from the impression you might get from this show um <laughs> um but I was saying, like, I don't know what's in the air lately. I am in a fucking spending mood, and I'm just, like, ready to shop. I, like, see something I want in the cart, pressed purchase. Haven't even thought about it for more than one second. Like, I don't know what's going on lately. Uh, It might be a problem, but it's what I'm kind of enjoying at the moment. Uh, Not looking at my bank account, because that would just make me sad. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not looking at my bank account until at least after I make a couple more expensive purchases, and then I, <laughs> and then I'll look, and then I'll weep, and I'll feel bad about it. But in the meantime, and then you'll cool it, yeah, yeah, and then I'll cool my jets. But for now, I'm feeling pretty good. Um, but yeah, no, apparently though, it does take um, 30 days to form a habit. So if you buy something expensive every day for 30 days, then it becomes a problem. Once or twice is fine okay. though. I mean, it's not been 30 days. It's been a couple of weeks, not gonna lie, so we're getting close, so I gotta cut it off soon. (laughs) But (laughs) right now we're fine. I don't know, like, because this, like, last week, so I don't don't know what day it is. Whenever you guys are listening to this, record store day is today, April 22nd. That's the day we're recording this episode. Yeah. And... Honestly, like, I have a vinyl hookup in uh, BC that I, he, he gives me all my things. So I have been emailing this man for three months, ever since the, like, since February when all the stuff was announced. And me and this man, constant communication, and I dropped literally, like, $300 on vinyls lately. And I'm like, all right, we need to, we need to stop. This is, like... A little much. <laughs> You're like, this is extra, even for me. What are we doing? But, like, also, even though I've already bought the things that, like, I really wanted, I'm still contemplating going to the store to check out some other things after we're done recording. Because I do think I have a problem. But <laughs> it's one I'm fine with right now so it's fine it only happens once a year right yeah you're like this is an acceptable problem at least for right now so yeah no i'm in the same boat as jen as well i've uh, i won't say a numerical amount because i have my (laughs) suspicions but i I mean she has a ps5 behind her that she just (laughs) bought so you guys can guess the ballpark that's 100 percent true uh and then of course well you got get the ps5 you got to get some games right so then exactly. I so then I got some games and then before this whole nonsense even started so here's the thing it's not even like a big because I'm lacking in the game department because I've been currently playing this game on the switch called bug snacks every night for like hours and hours and hours <laughs> So it's not even like I'm lacking in entertainment. I was just like thinking about it and I'm like, yeah, I've wanted one of these for a long time. Fuck it, I guess. <laughs> Literally, that's me. I'm like buying all these vinyls, looking at iPads. Amazon is like at my door every day. I'm like, Jeff Bezos, I'm sorry. Like, I Jeff, need, Jeff need Bezos to cut has my phone number on speed dial at this point for how Literally. much I purchased in the last little while. It started with a shower head, and it, it's gone so downhill from there. 
we spiraled. Mine started with Gorilla Grip tape, and since then I've also spiraled. <laughs> Just... <laughs> So this podcast episode is going to be an intervention, um... <laughs> but neither of us want to hear about it. So it'll be an intervention amongst all of you listeners into, oh, wow. <laughs> yep, I do have a problem. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is a problem. Enjoy yourselves. Literally. I just, yeah, I don't want to talk about it because, I mean, actually, I do want to talk about it because... I want to spend more money, it's but I thrilling. don't want to talk about stopping. <laughs> yeah, but you I know? don't want to talk about stopping. We'll we'll tap into that next week and see if, if see if the spending has calmed down. I have doubts <laughs> for myself personally, but Same. we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, no, I'm trying to think if there was anything else this week other than us collectively losing our minds over shopping. Um, oh yeah, I got I'm getting, currently in the process of being poisoned from my tap water, so that's fun. <laughs> Jesus, lake what life, else am is I right? New? Well, how is it that every time we do something, it's like, yeah, guess what, Jen? I got food poisoning. I got water poisoning. I got poison poisoned. <laughs> and it's like, it just never stops. It doesn't. I actually do feel like you right now because I have been sick for weeks. Like, mm-hmm. I got a cold, um, like, right around the beginning of April. And, like... It's still here. Like, I'm still congested. This this sucker hasn't gone away. See, uh, I have thankfully not been sick, which is abnormal for me because I'm usually sick constantly. Um, but I did recently discover I'm allergic to snow mold. So that's fun. <laughs> I actually, speaking of allergies, I got booked in for an allergy test on in May. So I guess we'll see if I'm allergic to anything because mm-hmm. I feel like the only thing I know for sure I'm allergic to is dust and um, nickel. Yes. But I'm curious to see if there's like anything else that I've just been like suffering through. Right. It's like uh, I went for an allergy test because uh, my doctor was trying to figure out my tonsil problems. How does that relate? Can't tell you. But I did do the test. Uh, <laughs> and it's like snow mold sunflower oil, nickel, and, um, oh, I'm also allergic to yuzu, like that, like, Japanese citrus flavor. Ooh, I love yuzu. That's a shame. I do, too, except for it makes my tongue very, very, very itchy. (laughs) (laughs) You know what? I feel like I did know that from the one time we went out to the, the disco sushi bar in Banff. Which is a real thing that happened. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> it is <laughs> for her bachelorette party. It's true. Yeah, no, because I had um, it was like a a yuzu cocktail, and I this was before I knew I had an allergy to do it to it, and I took a couple sips, and then I ended up trading with somebody else because I was like, I don't know, this is making me feel a little funny in like a not good, a not good kind of way. Yeah, I think you pawned it off on John. If I think I'm so remembering. too. <laughs> that that would check out for normal behavior, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> oh gosh, but yeah, and I mean that's all I got for this week. It was just uh, I'm a shopaholic. I love it. Uh, I can't drink the tap water, and I've also been working. So that's about that. Sounds about right. But um, we should get right into our wheel of questions because I've got a story for you today, and I'm excited to share it. Yoo-hoo! How do you feel about new people coming into the family? And by this, I would mean like, you know, like someone's adopted in or like married in or like that type of thing. Like, how do I feel about it? Yeah. I mean, like, personally, I don't really care. Like, if it's somebody who's like marrying in or like my we just have like a family friend who my parents decide to adopt one day. I'd be like, yeah, okay, that checks out. The only time I would have a problem with it is, like, say in the situation of it being, like, somebody's uh, partner and they're, like, a total dickhead, (laughs) then I (laughs) might have some words. Uh, But overall, I feel like I'm pretty, like, I'm pretty good with it. Yeah, I would say the same. I feel like I've never had an issue where someone new has come into the family who I'm like, I despise you. Get rid of them now. (laughs) 
They're, they're cut. <laughs> they're cut. Yeah, no, because uh, maybe it's a certain personality type, but yeah, no, I can't say me or you have ever had those problems, not by my recollection anyways. Not yet, at least. I, I was about There's to still say, time. there is definitely still time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's spin for our next question. Number one. What's your favorite nursery rhyme? Nursery rhyme? Oh, boy. Uh... My niece, uh, she loves Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, so... I've heard it about a thousand times, so right now I'm impartial to that one, personally. Fair enough. See, for whatever reason, my parents played us a bunch of, like, non-traditional nursery rhymes when I was, like, a really little kid. So, like, I remember a couple that I really liked when I was little. One of them was, like, Pop Goes the Weasel. Yeah, I liked that one, too. Yeah, and then I also uh, liked uh, The Cat Came Back. Oh, yeah. I also, I like, as a kid, I really liked Mary's Got a Little Lamb. Mm-hmm. Or but... the Itsy Bitsy Spider or something. Yeah. <laughs> the classics. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'd fuck with the Itsy Bitsy Spider. She seems cool. I like that she wakes the <laughs> old man up in the middle of the in the middle of the night for no reason and he bonks his head or I don't know which one that is but <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a different one I think you're thinking of um oh the, the it's raining it's pouring the old man is yeah! snoring he bonks his head and couldn't wake up in the morning yeah <laughs> you mean the spider was this involved? man dead I feel like she was involved rain. somehow she crawled up the water spout and then he bonked his head and that's it that's how the nursery rhyme goes it's done. He's done. He's done. His goose got cooked. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Do we spin to our next question? Yeah, let's spin again. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Do you think new family members can affect the dynamic that you have with your, like, siblings or your parents or, like, your cousins who you've known for, like, a long time? Oh, absolutely, because... Like, any relationship that people have with each other can be impactful to, like, like family circles and stuff like that. So, like, like say your, like, some, your, your sister marries a dude and he's a part of the family now, but she acts completely different when she's, in, like, around him than she does when she's around her family. That's pretty impactful. I would agree. I feel like people can definitely change depending on the relationship that they're in because I feel like when you do marry someone, you spend a lot of time with that person. So I feel like you kind of evolve and grow with that person. And if it's a negative thing, I feel like it can really show up in a negative way towards everyone else in your life. Oh, absolutely. And it's like um, my husband, like a long time ago, he said that he was reading something once about people's psychology. And it's that you are going to end up most like the five people you spend the most time with. So that could be friends, that could be family, that can be your partner. So if you don't have, like, a group of, like, close five people that you either don't like or you don't really agree with what they do, it then you're going to end up like them whether you like it or not. I would agree. This is why me and Emily share one brain cell. This is true. And nobody else is allowed to have it because that's all we have. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot share. It's, it will kill us instantly. We have to share it. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I let Jen borrow the whole brain cell, I ate expired cheese. I know. Let's spin for a last question. Okay. All right. Let's hear it. What would you do if your sibling or parent or family member who was close to you married or remarried to someone who you didn't like or have a good relationship with? Fist fight. Fist, you're going <laughs> physical immediately. <laughs> All right. Emily's going to murder someone. Just it's confirmed. Jokes. Uh, okay. But like, as like an IRL, if this is somebody who we've had multiple conversations about for multiple times, I've been like, they are garbage. You deserve better. They are mean. Why are you with them? And then they like marry or remarry them and like insist on associating with them. 
My thing is I would probably end up cutting them out from my life. But what if, like, I don't know, maybe this is just you, but, like, because I feel like sometimes when, like, a friend or a family member is in a relationship that you can kind of, like, see from the outside looking in that it's toxic, Mm -hmm. I personally wouldn't always say something because I'd want to leave the door open for that person to talk to me if they needed to. Mm -hmm. And I feel like by sometimes by telling them, like, hey, your relationship's really toxic, you're kind of putting a strain there. Yeah. So what if you hadn't told them? Like, what would you do in that situation? And then they end up marrying this person. Okay, if we're going off the assumption that my family member's marrying a garbage person and I've never really told them that I think that they're a garbage person... I would probably at least try to have a conversation where I'm not, like, shunning their relationship. Because obviously if they're choosing to marry them, it's because they love and care about them. They're not going to... That's not going to be something that changes overnight. But I would say, like, what Mm -hmm. my causes of concern would be. I'd be like, you know, I'm happy that you're taking this, like, approach in your life and you want to make this step. However, I will say there have been a couple times, for example, this situation where I feel like they weren't being very respectful and I just want you to know that, you know, I don't really think that's okay, but but obviously I'm not going to be the expert on your relationship, and maybe that's something to be concerned about. Yeah. I don't know. I hate confrontation, so I hate shit like that. I feel like I would just live with it begrudgingly and just be like, oh, this fucking guy. I'm assuming it's See? a man that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> That is usually what happens. Yeah, no, I'm not really <laughs> big on confrontation either, but, like, I draw the line, though, uh, if it's, like, harm to a person. Like, like okay, yeah. if it's, like, a couple random things here and there, like, maybe they make gross jokes or something, like, whatever. Like, it's not really something that impacts me directly, but if it's, like, physical harm, then, yes, Emily will be resorting to violence. If Fists on sight. <laughs> copy that good to know (laughs) yeah i will defend your honor uh but yeah no um, uh, any of emily's siblings listening be warned yeah right and uh but yeah no we know which ones you are yeah they do (laughs) but yeah no i definitely draw the line at like like that kind of stuff where it's anything to do with like abuse situations like i mm -mm, i will not take it i will not accept it never gonna happen yeah, that's fair. I feel like that's kind of separate in my head than, like, just not liking someone because they give you a weird vibe or you just don't get along type mm-hmm. of thing or you're just very different people and, you oh, know. Oh, yeah, no, in that case, I would ignore them too then. If it's simply just, like, the vibes are off and, like, you can't really put your finger on it and you don't really like them, then I'm like, okay. Whatever. <laughs> I, not my circus, not my monkeys. <laughs> I'll let it slide for now yeah you've been warned <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> all right but that's the end of our questions do you have any guesses as to what i'm talking about today all right uh my guess is that it's going to be somebody probably uh, a lady married a man and the man became a part of the family and then somebody else didn't like him and then they killed him well, singing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Hmm, not quite. Okay. Um, I was actually inspired to tell this story because of our last episode um, where you were talking about Lizzie Borden and I realized we've never talked about her on the show. <gasps> oh, well, I didn't even realize either. I just like know of her name like as a notorious figure, but I don't know anything about her story either. Yeah, I I honestly didn't know too much either before I started researching. Like, I've heard, like, the... I feel like everyone, like, has heard of her or has heard the, like, little rhyme that's, like, synonymous with her name. But, mm. um, yeah. I'm So let me just jump right on into her story because oh, yeah. I'm sure almost everybody listening knows about Lizzie Borden, who was accused of, like... Being like an axe murderer. Ee, ee, ee. That yep. was me stabbing someone with a knife. Um, <laughs> ee, 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 with, with the axe. Ee, ee, ee. 
Yeah, yeah, that's the only thing I know too is just that she was accused of axing her own family, and that's all I know. Yes, well, let's jump into it. So, Lizzie Andrew Borden was born on July 19th, 1860 in Fall River, Massachusetts to Sarah Anthony Borden and Andrew Jackson Borden. Her father was of English and Welsh descent and grew up in a very modest surrounding and struggled financially as a young man, despite being the descendant of wealthy and influential local residents. Andrew eventually prospered in the manufacture and sale of furniture and caskets, then became a successful property developer. He was the director of several textile mills and owned considerable commercial property. He was also the president of Union Savings Bank and a director to the Durfee Safe Deposit and Trust Co. At his death, his estate was valued at $300,000, which would be equivalent to $9.6 million in today's money. So, man's had money to spend. I, I wish that I had his bank account to spend because my problems would be worse. But it <laughs> yeah, would be great. With our spending lately, we both need some, some, uh, <laughs> some cashola. So despite his wealth, Andrew was known for being super frugal. Unlike Emily and I, this man was not on Amazon every day, um, mainly because it didn't exist yet. <laughs> <laughs> So, for instance, the Borden home lacked indoor plumbing, although at the time, it was a common accommodation for the wealthy. It was in an affluent area, but the wealthiest residents of Fall River, including Andrew's cousins, lived generally in a more fashionable neighborhood called The Hill, which was farther from the industrial areas of the city. Lizzie and her older sister, Emma had a relatively religious upbringing and attended Central Congregational Church, and as young women, Lizzie was very involved in the church activities, including teaching Sunday school to children of recent immigrants to the United States. She was involved in religious organizations such as the Christian Endeavor Society, for which served she served as the secretary treasurer, and contemporary social movements such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She was also a member of the Ladies' Fruit and Flower Mission, which sounds very 18th century. It could not get more 18th century, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. So three years after the death of Lizzie's mother, Sarah, Andrew, her father, remarried a man named Abby Dufry Gray in 1828. Lizzie stated that she called her stepmother Mrs. Borden, and they had a cordial relationship. She believed that Abby had married her father for his wealth, and Bridget Sullivan, whom they called Maggie, was the Borden's 25-year-old live-in maid who had immigrated to the U.S. from Ireland, testified that Lizzie and Emma rarely ate meals with their parents, and in May 1892, Andrew killed multiple pigeons in his barn with a hatchet, believing they were attracting local children to hunt them. Lizzie had recently built a roost for the pigeons, and it has been commonly recounted that she was upset over his killing of them, though the veracity of this has been disputed. So, she didn't have a great relationship with her stepmother, and it kind of seemed like the relationship with her father was disintegrating at this time quite rapidly. Yes. I'm so glad you agree. So, a family argument in July 1982 prompted both sisters to take extended quote-unquote vacations in New Bedford. After returning to Fall River a week before the infamous murders, Lizzie chose to stay in a local rooming house for four days before returning to her family residence. Tension had been growing within the Borden family in the months before the murders, especially over Andrew's gifts of real estate to various branches of Abby's family. After their stepmother's sister received a house, the sisters demanded and received a rental property, the home they had lived in there until their mother died, 
which they purchased from their father for one dollar. A few weeks before the murders, they sold the property back to their father for five thousand dollars, which would be equivalent to about one hundred and fifty one thousand dollars in today's money. So that was a pretty penny. No kidding. The night before the murders, John Morse, the brother of Lizzie and Emma's deceased mother, visited and was invited to stay for a few days to discuss business matters with his brother-in-law, Andrew. Some writers have speculated that their conversation, particularly about property transfer, may have aggravated an already tense situation. For several days before the murders, the entire household had been violently ill. A family friend later speculated that Mutton left on the stove to use in meals over several days was the cause, but Abby had feared poison, given that Andrew had not been a popular man. So, John arrived the evening of August 3rd and slept in the guest room that night. After breakfast the next morning, at which Andrew, Abby, Lizzie, John, and the Borden's maid, maid Maggie were present, Andrew and John went to the sitting room where they chatted for nearly an hour. John left around 8.48 a.m. to buy a pair of oxen for his niece in Fall River, planning to return to the Borden home for lunch at noon. Andrew left for his morning walk sometime after 9 a.m. Although the cleaning of the guest room was one of Lizzie and Emma's regular chores, Abby went upstairs sometime between 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. to make the bed. According to the forensic investigation, Abby was facing her killer at the time of the attack. She was first struck on the side of the head with a hatchet, which cut her just above the ear, causing her to turn and fall face down on the floor, creating a concussion on her nose and forehead. Sorry, creating contusions on her face and forehead, not a concussion. I was about to say, that would be quite the interesting medical diagnosis. (laughs) (laughs) It was the 1800s, like, who's to say? That's true, there's that whole thing where they're like, "Mm, yes, take this heroin and to treat the ghosts in your blood. (laughs) Exactly. Logically. Let's just drill a hole. That should get rid of the headaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just needs to breathe. <laughs> There's not enough oxygen in there. We gotta, gotta make a hole. <laughs> so her killer then struck her multiple times, delivering 17 more hits to the back of her head, which definitely killed her. You're, you're pretty sure on that? <laughs> I'm like 98% <laughs> sure. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Like, I I would put money on the fact that after 17 hits to the head, she was dead. See, I think she um, could have pulled through. Mm, it could have been something else. It's 50-50 for me. It's <laughs> 50-50. We'll take it. <laughs> so when Andrew returned home around 10.30 a.m., his key failed to open the door, so he knocked. Maggie went to unlock the door, finding, finding it jammed. She uttered a curse. She would later testify that she heard Lizzie laughing immediately after this. She did not see Lizzie, but stated that the laughter was coming from the top of the stairs. This was considered significant as Abby was already dead by this time and her body would have been visible to anyone on the home's second floor. Lizzie later denied being upstairs and testified that her father had asked her where Abby was, to which she replied that a messenger had delivered Abby a summons to visit a sick friend. Maggie stated that she had then removed Andrew's boots and helped him into his slippers before he lay down on the sofa for a nap. Um, And this was a detail that was contradicted by the crime scene photos because Andrew was still wearing his boots for what's about to happen next. So, Maggie informed Lizzie of a department store sale. Lizzie said Maggie was welcome to come along with her, but Maggie felt unwell and went to take a nap in her bedroom instead. Maggie testified that she was in her third floor room resting from cleaning windows when just before 11, 10 a.m., she heard Lizzie call from downstairs. She said, quote, Maggie, come quick. Father's dead. Somebody came in and killed him. Andrew was slumped on the couch down in the downstairs sitting room, struck 10 or 11 times with a hatchet-like weapon. One of his eyes had been split cleanly in two, which, horrifying. That's my worst nightmare. I don't, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> his, 
eye? His eye? Eyeball? His his eyeball. In his two? whole eyeball. In two pieces. That's two halves too much. <laughs> That's two pieces too many. It should be one piece only. Absolutely. Unnecessary. Very. Um, so... This kind of suggested that he had been asleep when attacked. His still bleeding wound suggested a very recent attack. Dr. Bowden, the family's physician, arrived from his home across the street and pronounced both victims dead. Detectives estimated that Andrew's death had occurred at approximately 11 a.m. Lizzie's initial answers to the police officer's questions were at times strange and contradictory. Initially, she heard she reported hearing a groan or a scraping noise or distress call before entering the house. Two hours later, she told police she had heard nothing and entered the house, not realizing that anything was wrong. When asked where her stepmother was, she recounted Abby receiving a note asking her to visit a sick friend. She also stated that she thought Abby had returned and asked if someone could go upstairs to look for her. Maggie had a neighbor, Mrs. Churchill, were halfway up the stairs, their eyes level with the floor when they looked into the guest room and saw Abby lying face down on the floor. Most of the officers who interviewed Lizzie reported that they disliked her attitude. She said sometimes she was too calm and poised. Despite her attitude and changing alibis, she was not checked for blood stains. Police did search her room, but it was a curiosity inspection, and at the trial, they admitted to not doing a proper search because Lizzie was not feeling well. They were subsequently criticized for their lack of diligence. In the basement, police found two hatchets, two axes, and a hatchet head with a broken handle. The hatchet head was suspected to be the murder weapon, as the break in the handle appeared fresh and the ash and dust on the head, unlike that on the other bladed tools, appeared to have been deliber- deliberately applied to make it look as though it had been in the basement for some time. However, none of these tools were removed from the house. Because of the mysterious illness that had struck in the household before the murders, the family's milk and Andrew's and Abby's stomachs during the autopsies performed in the border dining room were tested for poison and none was found. Residents suspected Lizzie of purchasing hydrocinic acid in a diluted form from the local drug house, and her defense was that she inquired about the acid in order to clean her furs, despite the local medical examiner's testimony that it did not have any antiseptic properties. Lizzie and Emma's friend, Alice Russell, decided to stay with them the the night following the murders, while John spent the night in the attic guest room, which is contrary to later accounts that he slept in the murder site guest room. Me, personally, would not be sleeping in the house at all. That's just me. Yeah, no, that feels like a bad idea in general at this point, but who's to say? Like, especially the friend. (laughs) She's like, yeah, I'll come have a sleepover with you guys. It's fine. Yeah, she's like, I'm just chilling, just hanging out. Life's good. (laughs) I'm here for support. I would be like, nah, girl, we gotta get out of here. We're leaving (laughs) We gotta go. Right? (laughs) I would not stay the night there. Oh, hell no. (laughs) Not after all this. So, police were stationed around the house on the night of August 4th, during which an officer said he had seen Lizzie enter the cellar with Alice carrying a kerosene lamp and a sop pail. He stated he saw both women exit the cellar, after which Lizzie returned alone, though he was unable to see what she was doing. He stated it appeared that she was bent over the sink. On August 5th, John left the house and was mobbed by hundreds of people. Police had to escort him back to the house. And on August 6th, police conducted a more thorough search of the house, inspecting the sister's clothing and confiscating the broken-handled hatchet head. That evening, a police officer and the mayor visited the Bordens, and Lizzie was informed that she was a suspect in the murder. The next morning... Alice entered the kitchen to find Lizzie tearing up a dress. She explained that she was planning to put it in the fire because it was covered in paint. 
It was never determined whether the dress she had been wearing on the day of the murders. But that is very suspicious. See, but you can't just say your outfit's covered in paint and then have nothing to show for it. Oh yeah, I'm just burning it because it has paint on it. Like, don't look at it too closely. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not telling you what color paint either. Just go away. (laughs) It's red paint. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So Lizzie appeared at the inquest hearing on August 8th. Her request to have her family attorney present was refused under a state statute providing that an inquest must be held in private. She had been prescribed regular doses of morphine to help calm her nerves, and it is possible that her testimony was affected by this. Her behavior was erratic, and she often refused to answer a question even if the answer would have been beneficial to her. She often contradicted herself and provided alternating accounts of the morning in question such as saying she was in the kitchen reading a magazine when her father arrived home then saying she was in the dining room doing some ironing and then saying she was coming downstairs the district attorney was very aggressive and confrontational and honestly this is why i'm glad that now people have the right to have their attorney present because i feel like even if you've done nothing wrong Like, being interrogated or questioned like this would make you nervous and make you say stupid things, you know? Oh, for sure. Especially, like, you know, (laughs) the the whole thing's already so anxiety-inducing, and then you're just adding layers to it. Like, of course, right? And also, like, your family's dead. (laughs) Like, you would be under so much... Any any person, guilty or not, would be under duress, I feel. so in this situation, for sure definitely i don't know if she's guilty or not but yeah that's all i'm gonna say so on august 11th lizzie was served with a warrant of arrest and jailed the inquest testimony the basis for modern debate regarding her guilt or in innocence was later ruled inadmissible at her trial in june 1893 um, the newspaper articles noted that Lizzie possessed a stolid demeanor and bit her lips, uh, flushed and bent towards attorney Adams, which just sounds like she was nervous to me. I don't know. Yeah. Like chewing your lips <laughs> and being <laughs> poised away from other people does sound like anxiety. Talking to your attorney? Yeah, she's guilty for sure. (laughs) You see her? Gnawing on that lip? Guilty behavior. (laughs) Jail immediately. No trial needed. (laughs) Yeah. It was also reported that the testimony testimony provided in the inquest had caused a change of opinion among her friends who have heretofore strongly maintained her innocence. The inquest received significant press attention nationwide, including an extensive three-page write-up in the Boston Globe. A grand jury began hearing evidence on November 7th, and Lizzie was indicted on December 2nd. Lizzie's trial took place in New Bedford starting on June 5th, 1893. Prosecuting attorneys were Hoysa M. Knowlton, the future U.S. Supreme Court Justice, uh, Justice William H. Modi. Defending were Andrew V. Jennings, Melvin O. Adams, and former Massachusetts Governor George D. Robinson. Five days before the trial's commencement on June 1st, another axe murderer incurred in Fall River. The time, This time the victim was Bertha Manchester, who was found hacked to death in her kitchen. The similarities between the Manchester and Borden murders were striking and noted by jurors, which is really interesting, I think. However, Jose Correa de Malo, a Portuguese immigrant, was later convicted of the Manchester murders in 1894 and was determined to not have been in the vicinity of Fall River at the time of the Borden murders. It is still kind of weird to me, though. See, though, like... Two people are not going to kill the same way. If they have a murder victim with all the same features, I think that would be worth looking into. It also, like, I don't know anything about the Manchester murders. I didn't look into it yet, but it kind of, like, 
gives the vibe of like maybe they had the wrong guy. Maybe then. I don't know. It's all very I don't know. weird though. I got to look into it now because it's just kind of like weird enough where you're like maybe they got the wrong guy in those and like Lizzie genuinely didn't kill her family and someone just got away with both murders. That's entirely possible too, especially since it was the 1800s. Ooh. It's a conspiracy theory based on no facts, but here I am presenting <laughs> our favorite to all kind. Of you. <laughs> exactly. So, a prominent point of discussion in the trial, or at least the press coverage of it, was the hatchet head found in the basement, which was not convincingly demonstrated by the prosecution to be the murder weapon. Prosecutors argued that the killer had removed the handle because it would have been covered in blood. One officer testified that the hatchet handle was found near the hatchet head, but another officer contradicted this. Though no bloody clothing was found at the scene, Alice testified on August 8, 1892, that she witnessed Lizzie burn a dress in the kitchen stove, saying it had been ruined when she brushed against wet paint. During the trial, of course, defense never attempted to challenge this statement. Lizzie's presence at the home was also a point of dispute during the trial. According to the testimony, Maggie entered the second floor of the home around 10 58 a.m and left lizzie and her father downstairs lizzie told several people at this time that she went into the barn and was not in the house for 20 minutes or possibly half an hour liam lubinsky testified for the defense that he saw lizzie leaving the barn at 11 3 a.m and charles garner confirmed the time at 11 10 a.m lizzie called maggie downstairs told her Andrew had been murdered and ordered her not to enter the room. Instead, Lizzie sent to get a doctor. Both victims had been removed during autopsy and the skulls were admitted as evidence during the trial presented on June 5th, 1893. Upon seeing them in the courtroom, Lizzie fainted. Evidence was excluded that Lizzie had sought to purchase some acid purportedly for cleansing seal skin cloak from a local druggist on the day before the murders. Uh, The judge ruled that the incident was too remote in time to have any connection. The presiding associate justice, Justin Dewey, who had been appointed by Robinson when he was the governor, delivered a lengthy summary that supported the defense at his charge to the jury before it was sent to deliberate on June 20th, 1893. After an hour and a half of deliberation, the jury acquitted Lizzie of the murders. Upon exiting the courthouse, she told reporters she was, quote, the happiest woman in the world. The trial had been compared to the later trials of Bruno Hopman, Ethel, and Julius Rosenberg, and the O.J. Simpson as a landmark publicity and public interest in the history of American legal proceedings. Although acquitted at the trial, Lizzie remained the prime suspect in her father's and stepmother's murders. Where writer Victoria Lincoln proposed in 1970, 1967 that Lizzie might have committed the murders while in a few states. Um, another prominent suggestion was that she was physically and sexually abused by her father, which drove her to kill him. There is little evidence to support this, but in some but incest is not a topic that would have been discussed at the time, and the methods for collecting physical evidence would have been quite different in 1892. This belief was put into local newspapers at the time of the murders and was revisited by scholar Marcia Carlyle in a 1992 essay. Mystery author Evan Hunter, in his 1984 novel Lizzie, suggested that Lizzie committed the murders after being caught in a tryst with Maggie. Ed McBain, an American author, elaborated elaborated on his speculation in a 1999 interview, speculating that Abby had caught Lizzie and Maggie together and reacted with horror and disgust that Lizzie had killed Abby with a candlestick. When Andrew returned, she had confessed to him, but killed him in rage with a hatchet when he reacted exactly as Abby had. Ed McBain further speculates that Maggie disposed of the hatchet somewhere afterwards. In later years, Lizzie was rumored to be a homosexual, 
but there was no such speculation about Maggie, who found other employment after the murders and later married a man she met while working as a maid in Butte, Montana. And this is really interesting to me because one thing about this case that, like, doesn't quite sit right is the fact that the stepmother was murdered quite brutally and Maggie was in the house and didn't hear it. You know, like they just like didn't find the stepmother until later. It seems like that's the kind of thing you would hear going down. Yeah. And like, it also makes you wonder too, because like when these types of things happen where it's like a brutal murder too, where obviously there would have been some form of sound that probably would have been happening and people are like, no, I didn't hear a thing. It always feels mildly complicit where I'm like, you, either you didn't want to hear or, you know, like, there's no way you wouldn't have known or wouldn't have heard anything. And, like, wouldn't have discover, discovered the stepmother earlier, you know? Like, the yeah. fact that they're like, a messenger came for her. Like, I think that's the kind of thing you would know whether that actually happened or didn't. I'm just saying, if somebody died in my house, I would know about it immediately. <laughs> Exactly. I like, also live in a shoebox. This man which is a didn't completely even have irrelevant point. <laughs> yeah, like this man didn't even have plumbing in his house. Like, what are the chances that those walls weren't fucking paper thin? Oh, probably. Like, like I don't know. It, you're right, though. It it seems a little fishy. Like, there's been a couple of things now that you've mentioned where I'm like, mm, okay, okay. Yeah. So Maggie died in Butte in 1948, where she allegedly gave a deathbed confession to her sister, stating that she had changed her testimony on the stand in order to protect Lizzie. Another significant suspect is John, Lizzie's maternal uncle, who rarely met with the family after his sister died, but had slept in the house the night before the murders, according to law enforcement. John had provided an absurdly perfect and over-detailed alibi for the death of Abby Borden. He was considered a suspect by police for a period. Others noted as potential suspects in, in the crimes included Maggie, possibly retaliation for being ordered to clean the windows on a hot day. Which, honestly, you know what? Slay. I love that they say possible retaliation. That's full retaliation. <laughs> Super slay. <laughs> For cleaning the windows. I <laughs> I have no words for that. Um Relatable. Honestly I kinda hope that's the case. That would be you know what? I would accept that above many of these other things you've mentioned so far. If somebody asked me to go outside and clean windows on a hot day too, that might put me in a murderous mood too. <laughs> it would it would for sure push me over the edge. Oh yeah. And be this, like, these the fucking string. men. <laughs> yeah, these fucking men. It's time to die. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the day of the murders was unusually hot. And at the time, she was still recovering from the mystery illness that had struck the household. So, like, honestly, just, like, further confirmation. Like, you want me to go outside on a hot day, clean the windows, and I'm getting over an illness? That's too much. Fuck right off. Yeah, too much. Yeah, like, that's too much. So, a man named William Borden, suspected to be Andrew's illegitimate son, was noted as a possible suspect by writer Arnold Brown, who surmised in his book, Lizzie, the legend, the truth, the final chapter, that William had tried and failed to extort money from his father. However, author Leonard Rebello did extensive research on William Borden in Brown's book and was able to prove he was not Andrew Borden's son. Although Emma had an alibi at Fairhaven about 15 miles from Fall River, crime writer Frank Spearberg proposed in his 1984 book, Lizzie, that she might have secretly visited the residence to kill her parents before returning to Fairhaven to receive the telegram informing her of the murders. Which, honestly, like, she had just as bad of a relationship with them as Lizzie did, so it's not impossible, but... After the trial, the Borden sisters moved into a large, modern house in the Hill neighborhood in Fall River. Around this time, Lizzie began using the name Elizabeth, a Borden, at their new house, which Elizabeth dubbed Maplecroft, 
they had staff that included living maids, a housekeeper, and a coachman. Because Abby was ruled to have died before Andrew, her estate went first to Andrew, then at his death, passed to his daughters as part of his estate. A considerable settlement, however, was paid to settle claims by Abby's family. Despite the acquittal, Lizzie was ostracized by Fall River Society. Her name was again brought to the public eye when she was accused of shoplifting in 1897 in Providence, Rhode Island. In 1905, shortly after an argument over a party that Elizabeth had given for actress Nance O'Neill, Emma moved out of the house and never saw her again. Lizzie was ill in her last year following the removal of her gallbladder. She died of pneumonia on June 1, 1927 in Fall River. Funeral details were not published and few attended. Nine days later, Emma died of chronic nephritis at age 76 in a nursing home in New Market, New Hampshire. Having moved to this location in 1923 for both health reasons and to avoid renewed attention following the publication of another book about the murders. The sisters, neither of whom ever got married, were buried side by side in the family plot in Oak Grove Cemetery. At the time of her death, Lizzie was worth over $250,000, which is equivalent to $5.2 million in today's money. So she was a wealthy woman, and she owned a house on the corner of French Street and Belmont Street, so several office buildings, shares in several utilities, two cars, and a large amount of jewelry. She left $30,000, equivalent to $628,000 today, to Fall River Animal Rescue League and $500, which is about 10 grand today, in trust for perpetual care of her father's grave. Her closest friend and cousin each received $6,000, which is about 126,000 today, substantial sums at the time of the estate distribution in 1927, and numerous friends and families each received between $1,000 and $5,000 which is 21000 to 105000 today. Scholar Anne Schofield notes that, quote, Lizzie's story has tended to take one of other two fictional forms, the tragic romance and feminist quest, as the story of Lizzie Borden has created and recreated through rhyme and fiction, it has taken on the qualities of a popular American myth or legend that effectively links the present to the past. The Borden House is now a museum and operates a bed and breakfast with 1890s styling. Pieces of evidence used in the trial, excluding or including the axe head, are preserved at the Fall River Historical Society. The case was memorialized in a popular skipping rope rhyme, sung to the tune of the then popular song Ta Ra Ra Doom De Ri, and goes as such. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Folklore says that the rhyme was made up by an anonymous writer as a tune to sell newspapers. Others attribute the ubiquitous but anonymous Mother Goose. In reality, Lizzie's stepmother suffered 18 or 19 blows, her father suffered 11, and the rhyme has a less well-known second verse and goes as such. Andrew Borden is now dead. Lizzie hit him on the head. Up in heaven, he will sing. On the gallows, she will swing. Holy shit. Wow, that is intense for a nursery rhyme? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, definitely not, you know, a soothing one. Like it's a little bitsy spider, but. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's a lot more morbid than the itsy bitsy spider. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of when people start talking about how um, Ring Around the Rosie is about the Black Plague or something. There's something about these, like, 1800s nursery rhymes. They're just, they are a whole other level. They're like, you know what? We're going to make this super dark, but kind of catchy so children will sing them. That yeah. sounds like fun. But it's, like, kind of fun. It's different. We love it. <laughs> Exactly. You know, it's like those like old, uh, old, uh, Grimm Brothers stories and how those used to be for oh, yeah. Yeah, used for children. Warning people and children. Ugh, boy. 
But yeah, that's my story. And that's the story of Lizzie Warden. Really interesting. And I feel like in my head, I thought I kind of knew the story. But when you actually like look into it, I feel like it's a lot different than popular culture kind of makes it out to be. And yeah. the like the one theory that her and Maggie were like having the secret romance and kind of killed the the step parents because they were caught is really interesting because I feel like at that time a lot of things like that were happening and it kind of like takes on this whole like lovers and then the one lover takes revenge which yeah. is really fun but like not in real life but just to think about you know what I mean <laughs> just to dally on you know I totally agree and it's also so for me when I when I when I thought of Lizzie Borden before and like the whole axe thing I was like oh yeah she killed her family like I didn't realize that it was so like vague I guess because I really thought it was like you know like oh yeah she she totally did like that's that's what they figured but there's just so many details that are not concrete I know and the fact that she was acquitted like I didn't even know that before mm-hmm. the, the fact that she like wasn't proven guilty like in See, my I head thought the she story was, was guilty too yeah yeah I thought she was like just a crazy person who just murdered her family one day randomly and was guilty or whatever mm-hmm. like that's what I thought but that's really not it at all and I feel like there's so many other suspects that she just kind of got thrown under the bus oh absolutely there's definitely more suspects and then two like there's so many other motivations and like it's so interesting to have the the majority, like, like talking with what we know today from crime stories, it's, like, already the fact that the stepmother got, it's so much worse compared to everybody else is very telling as well, because that include that would mean, like, a personal vendetta, right? Yeah. I don't know. And, like, it is interesting that, like, her and her sister, like, after the murders, like, got all this money and moved in together and how it just seemed to work out that the stepmother died first so all of her assets were transferred back to their father Mm -hmm. and then all of their his assets were transferred to the sisters like that is an interesting aspect that i feel like is there something there yeah all right it's uh, suspicious for sure so then what do you think is she the murderer or is she not the murderer i don't know i'm really torn on this one i feel like i want to look into it more and like I would be interested to hear about the Manchester murders as well and see if there really is any connection there because I feel Mm -hmm. like there could be like it's not necessarily a closed case for me like maybe once I read more I'll be like oh yeah this there's no way these are connected but right right now I'm like maybe they got the wrong guy and there is someone out there who committed both Right? See, for me, the vibes I get is that she was involved somehow, but I do think yeah. she probably had an accomplice or, you know, like, two. It just, yeah, like, it doesn't really seem like it's a, a one-off thing. It feels like there's a lot more inclusions than just, like, one person going wild and killing a bunch of people. Like, there's definitely more to it. And the fact that the friend Alice came over, stayed the night with him, and then they were seen going into the basement together, but, like, Alice was still down there when Lizzie came up, like, there's something about that part of it that feels weird to me, too, and I'm Mm -hmm. just like, I feel like we breezed past that way too quick. Oh, yeah, no. Well, and there's lots of things, too. It's, like, that, and then there was also, um... Something weird you said before, like, they had this, like, coordinated sleepover, and it's like, I don't know. It's it's odd, for sure. And the uncle, too. I feel like he kind of just showed up out of nowhere, was in a fight with them, yeah. and then stayed a couple nights and then left right after the murders. Like, yeah, that's right. also suspicious. I agree. I think the whole thing is mega suspicious. But that's all for our story today. We have no conclusive answers for you. I'm sorry, but um, that's the tale of Lizzie Borden. All right. If you liked today's episode, make sure to leave us a review on wherever you're listening to podcasts currently. Uh, any and all reviews are greatly ap- appreciated, but of course we request five stars. Um, we also have a website, which is www.wheelofcrime.com. If you'd like to check us out on there and learn, learn a little bit more about the show. We also have a Patreon, which is Wheel of Crime Podcast on Patreon. If you want to donate to the show. We have our email, which is wheelofcrime at gmail.com. If you want to send us an email and just share your thoughts, maybe you found out something cool. Maybe you have your own theory about Lizzie Borden. That could be really sweet to share. Um, And then we also have our social media. 
Uh, we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Wheel of Crime, if you want to follow there for updates. And lastly, we have our Google Doc up uh, for people to submit stories online through our uh, social media pages, if you want to check that out. And uh, yeah, I believe that's about it. Yes, that's it. That's all. We'll see you next week for another new episode. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.